Hello everyone, this should be part 5 of a series I'm doing uh, in between other series. Uh, this is New Testament quotes in an Old Testament context. And of course we're starting from the beginning of the accepted canon of the New Testament, which is Matthew. Um, and we've worked through a number of quotes so far, just looking at them, looking at their context in the New Testament, then looking in their context in the Old Testament, and determining based on what we can see or, or understand from not only the English that we have it presented in for those of us who are English speakers, which I would imagine were all of my audience, um, but in some cases trying to understand it or maybe just dig a little bit uh, deeper uh, than the overlaying English, which uh, for many of us we've already seen is oftentimes untrustworthy in most versions. Um, and part of the reason for that is, of course, the uh, poor understanding of uh, the Old Testament source language, and in my humble opinion, also the poor understanding of the source language in the New Testament. Classical Greek is not modern Greek. There are many differences. And if you uh, start digging around in Greek, and trying to understand Greek words and Greek tenses in classical Greek, you will find that there are uh, many sharp differences between what's considered Greek today and what would be considered Greek uh, of the time that these source documents were written. And, uh, of course, I go one further and claim that I, I just... I don't believe that all of the New Testament was per se written in Greek. If it were, I suppose I could only theorize, because there are many things that I discuss that are theories. Uh, I've never said anything other than The only time that there's going to be something that I'm not going to uh, clearly state is theoretical is when I'm saying, if I say that a text, if I say Brenton's says this, that's not a theory. It's just, a, it's a fact. Many other things are theories. And there are many people out there, especially now with how easy social media has made it for so many of us to have a voice. There are many people out there, especially people that are far better speakers and presenters than myself, that <clears throat> they, they are pushing off theories as facts. Uh, many of them are presenting histories that, in my opinion, are not entirely confirmed as confirmed. There are many that are claiming that histories are not confirmed and not giving enough ample proof of that. And I'm not aiming that comment at Anatoly Fomenko. That's not the point of that. The point is, we are in the midst of a journey that requires many theories and hypotheses from many different minds and a spirit of working together in absolute honesty so that we can come to some answers about these things. We have to have answers on these things. You know, when I, when I discovered how much of what has been passed off as concrete, accept acceptable uh, Old Testament vocabulary in the form of uh, the Masoretic texts, when I found out how much of it they admit is, uh, is unknown or dubious as far as its etymology goes, it just about knocked me over. 
And it, and it was really that that precipitated the various quests that I'm on. And speaking of those, with within a week or two, the Obri Project website will be up, and it will be under O B R Y P R O J E K T dot info. Should take one to two weeks, and once it's up, um, there is going to be a bit of a time uh, when there will be an interim time as far as um, me uh, getting to understand uh, how how quickly I can get files to the um, the the artist that's maintaining this site and how good a communications I will have with them. Um, and then there will be, I think, a little bit of a learning process of mine uh, to understand how I can most easily facilitate uh, all of that. It, it will have it will have the fonts. It will have immediately the unaltered uh, strongs list in, in the Obery font. Um, the font right now is Obery Beta 3. And it is beta because at this point there is uh, there's no absolute on you know should these characters stay this way absolutely I don't know that yet and the thing is as I learn about them I start getting a sense just here and there uh, concerning certain characters that perhaps they should be presented in a bit different way. Now, the Obrey Project website is going to be the format in which papers will be published concerning on re-understanding these characters as they would have been understood in the very first place to the people who wrote this text. They would have had an understanding of these characters. And yes, it is theoretical. I theorize that they would not have. They would not have to have had um, an understanding of these characters in the way that we understand most languages today, which is by letter. And those letters, uh, they're put together in a a directed way to create certain words. Uh, those put together sentences, and it's all based on fiat. To be redundant, fiat. If you have characters that have inherent meaning, and I'm not saying that these are necessarily hieroglyphic because there's a lot of different kinds of glyphs you can have, okay? You can have hieroglyphic. Um, it can be um, more idiomatic. And at this point in time, I believe them to be elemental. So, elemental ideographs, essentially, is what I believe that we're looking at. What I'm saying is, if the text were anything else, if the text were uh, like the individual characters were like uh, most of our languages today, then any one of those authors writing independently would have to have something akin to what we have today in dictionaries and lexicons and so forth. One of the reasons I don't believe this can be the case is the the variations upon roots that we can find in certain specific books. Isaiah is a good example of doing this, as is the book of Job. And... Um, they're just heavy in this kind of thing, as well as Ezekiel. But you will find this uh, peppered throughout many of the other books of uh, the, the current 39 books we have in the accepted canon of the Old Testament, that there will be these variations, and it would seem that the only way you could have these certain kinds of variations, which is basically using a character that's not commonly used or not used anywhere else, and you use this character to actually affect the two or three character parent root or maybe four character um, 
compound root, you use a character that you can't find used anywhere else to affect that in a certain way. And the only way that I believe that you are going to be able to do that is if these characters are, as I said, elemental ideographs. Now, is Greek made up of something similar, elemental ideographs? I'm not sure. At this point in time, I'm approaching Greek, which is at best tertiary to what I'm doing with, with Obri. I'm approaching it as a very much a phonetic language that is working from a lexicon. However, uh, should I see that it has the same sorts of characteristics to it, then at that point in time, uh, I will formulate uh, some kind of working hypothesis that it can be tested from. So. That's good. We're making progress as far as the Obrey project goes, and that is um, credit must be given uh, to not only the young lady that's done uh, a good amount of work, although she'd like to say that she doesn't. She has. In fact, she's working on uh, an Obrey copy of Genesis right now because I want to be able to have these texts of these books available also as well as that concordance in Obri so that people who want to start studying this language too to contribute to our overall understanding of what it actually is and how it's actually used they can use these tools they can use them to search roots within larger words, which you cannot do with Strong's and a number of other programs, especially when most of the time the full texts that you get of the, uh, the Masoretic Hebrew are right to left. Well, we're doing everything from left to right as well, so that it will make it far easier, easier for everyone who is... Uh, of an Occidental culture, which is most people that are going to be participating in this or listening to me, can have a far easier time with the orientation of this. It's, it's very disorienting to be looking at these languages absolutely backwards to the way that you have learned language to be. And you know what? It does not upset the character or the meanings of the characters to have the language in that direction. I do understand that with hieroglyphics there will be certain um, pictographs which depending on which direction they're shown in they can have an effect on say preceding or post seeding pictographs or or letters um, and because hieroglyphics is made up of so many different kinds of um, characters thousands but and that that's what they say they say that a certain pictograph faced in a certain direction will have a certain effect on uh, and you know that whole story of the guy who was said to have broken the code with hieroglyphics and all I just don't know <laughs> I don't know what I think of that story at this point in time so I'll just wait but it's gonna be good and not only I'm sorry uh, not only has has she been so helpful uh, but the patrons who have gone and uh, committed a certain amount of funds they're the ones who made the website possible so uh, I, we haven't reached like any goals where I would be able to put more time into it but as I said in the very first place uh, the first video that I said I was I was going to put up a patron make make it available for the Obery project and I said, even if nobody gave a dime ever, I would not stop from doing what I'm doing. I mean, that would be impossible. Um, I will continue. Uh, the whole point of that was to try to make it more, uh, to give me far more time to do it. Uh, you know, and I'm sure uh, that however it goes, um, 
I'm going to do all I can to make whatever it is work within time and within budget because this is my passion. It's not, it's not something I have to receive any pay to do. I never have. It was just something that would help speed things along. So we're going to see how it develops and all is good. So today I'm going to start, it's going to be at um, Matthew 8.17, and uh, I did leave off last time with the Matthew 4.15 and 16 quote, and that goes back to Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. Um, I got thrown off slightly by the the tense of, of one of the words in there. You see, there's a there's a statement being made in there, besides for the statement of the location of Zebulun and Naphtali, and how it would be very irregular just to say, if they were, say, in the far north uh, compared to Jerusalem, the far north as in um, the equivalent... Um, latitude of the Sea of Galilee, which I hate. Lake Galilee. <laughs> Anyways, um, it would be very uh, strange and unorthodox to uh, call them or consider them, even if we're talking about a region, the Et Galil, uh, a defined region, that would be that double L um, in Galil. Um, Agoyim, okay, so uh, a defined region of the nations. Even if so, the direction that we're supposedly looking towards for Zebulun and Naphtali, um, the description of Ober, Eyerdan, should not be a description that we're seeing concerning them, uh, nor what follows them. So I was thrown by that, and uh, I think that in and of itself uh, deserves some attention, and I'm sure it will get it as time goes by, because that, of course, is one of the things I'm working on, is to prove definitively one way or another whether or not these events could have happened in the Middle East, or whether they did, in fact, happen in the Middle East. The next quote, though, that we come by, is from Matthew 8.17. Uh, this one here, I don't think, like with some of the quotes from the wilderness temptation, um, I, I, don't, I don't see there being a point to spending too much time on it. So, sorry, Matthew 8.17. And here's why. Here's why. Because <clears throat> at this point in time, you would either have to read many chapters uh, of Isaiah, where the source text is supposed to be chapters in and around, uh, and then try to sort this out. You see, because when you go back and you read the actual quote itself, and I will, you can't determine from that context, um, you can and can't determine the the subject, okay? In a way, the subject, of course, starts chapters before, with the source being Yishro. Um, and it's very interesting, because Isaiah must have lived for some time. I mean, he lived over a number of kings, first off, uh, to where he would have seen so much of Aparim or Ephraim, which is the representative, essentially, of the um, the Ten Tribe um, peoples, which became the House of Yisrael. So oftentimes you'll hear Ephraim referred to, or sometimes Joseph, as a synonym for Israel. So, uh, many chapters before, there is a dialogue that, has, that continues for quite some time concerning uh, the divorce given to her and her redemption. It lasts for some time. 
Uh, now, obviously, if we're in a context of Israel's divorcement and a redemption thereof, um, definitely um, her Redeemer is going to be uh, contextually correct. But as I said, you're going to find yourself in a context of a very, very uh, large amount of text that all has to do with relatively the same thing, basically. Are there any triggers, you know, saying that this is uh, specifically uh, towards the Messiah or not? Well, not in the text that I've seen, no. However, there, there, are, there are a number of parallels that I've noticed in the past and as I've been thinking about these videos that I've been making, because as I said, I, I'm not pointing these things out because I believe that it is um, to be considered uh, nonsense or confusion. No, I, I think a lot of it could be what gets lost in translations or our understandings of translations and languages our um, preconceived notions about original autographs um, and uh, if it's if it's possible that theoretically what could be going on is that you show is actually uh, mirroring, reflecting the uh, the life of Israel. Uh, however, reflecting it in the way that Israel never did. Israel, if we want to just talk about the Ten Tribe, House of Israel, were never um, <clears throat> they were never obedient. They started out with, well, when they were part of the, the full nation, you know, which also included Judah, Benjamin, uh, when they were part of the full nation, then yeah, um, uh, to a degree. I mean, how far did the people uh, descend in the time of uh, Shomei or Solomon? Uh, it's hard to say off the top of my head right now. Of course, it was said through the prophet that the split of the kingdoms was due to the sins of Solomon. However, when the kingdom split, Jeroboam becomes the king of the house of Israel, and he instantly causes the people to go astray because he does not want them to go to Jerusalem for the feast days and to worship and he gives them false gods and, and, and idols instead and a unsanctioned priesthood in lieu of this and so that's why you'll see so many times when there was a new king of uh, Yisrael that, uh, that's chronicled in either Kings or Chronicles it's going to say and they followed uh, the sin of Jeroboam which he sinned against the people or made the people do, which is uh, whoring, spiritual whoring, oftentimes real physical actual whoring as well. It has to do with the spiritual whoring. So, um, I mean, that's one theory uh, to help us understand why we can't often understand the contextual link between the New Testament quote and what we see in the Old Testament passages. Um, because he does actually reflect um, Israel in many ways, except perfectly. I find that to be interesting, especially when you consider the um, what we understand about time and Yahweh not being in time, and how all of these things were established before the world was made. 
perhaps that gives us a better insight on why the, a lot of these quotes contextually they don't seem to uh, they don't make as much sense so there's a lot of factors that are playing in here not only language and assumptions about language and assumptions about source text and source text language and assumptions that a lot of the English translations are following really close to the source languages of either the uh, the New Testament and Greek I could I could read an Aramaic version as well a number of the Aramaic versions that I've looked at are in many ways they're following the same the difference between Aramaic uh, to English translations of the New Testament as compared to Greek to English translations of the New Testament and I've looked at all of them um, I, all of them that I know that are available let's say they're not they're not as divergent as one might think in some ways they are I, a student that had these multiple versions that was using them to cross-check a lot of different things they would they would find that they were getting some interesting nuggets here and there but there's so much that's arguable between the Greek and the Aramaic in the New Testament you know these, these people these people they could go back and forth forever probably so in in Matthew um, it was uh, 817 Okay, uh, Yusha is healing, and this is right after he comes to Peter's house, and Peter's mother-in-law is sick, and uh, in 8.15, he touched her hand, the fever left her, and she rose and ministered unto them. Uh, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. And this kind of relates to what I said yesterday, too, about looking into the occurrences of Shaitan in the Old Testament and kind of thinking about what we see there as compared to what we see like with Diablos or Daimonos. Um, it's actually Daimon. Um, right here. Oh, my bad. Diamond is zomai, um, the root daimon, demon. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> well, even uh, Greek versions uh, that we have, looking at the uh, the actual wording there, it's really interesting, because it's not that I don't believe that there are spiritual things happening that we we're not aware of. I, I never. I never said that. What I said was um, our understanding, or a number of people's understanding of it. That, see, there are some people out there that that fascinates them. That world, that unseen world, a spiritual world, you know, far different than our own. You know, far more powerful in a way than our own. You know, over the flesh or material world, it fascinates some people a lot. Um, I'm not saying it's not fascinating, uh, but I, I just, I've known some that are so fascinated by it that they, they turn so many texts which could actually be seen just as easily as something that could be explained in the natural, they turn it into something spiritual because they find that idea very fascinating. What's strange is a, a lot of us, our understanding of spiritual things or other things, um, unfortunately, we see a lot of it through the lens of pop culture, uh, the horror movies we've seen, or the legends or fables that we've heard. So the only reason I'm saying the things that I'm, I'm saying or asking the questions I'm asking about some of these notions concerning spiritual things is just because uh, I think it's good to question everything that 
we understand to be a notion or a theory or not proven. And that can kind of be seen in uh, Matthew 8.16 too. Can we look at it two ways? Uh, so, on to 8.17. Sorry about that. Now, 8.17, after he's, he's healed all these people they, they've brought to him. Matthew 8.17 says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And that's going to be back here. And I, I promise you, um, I can read a little bit around it too. Uh, however, you really need to read chapters, chapters before this and, and get a sense of bearing before you read this. This is a lot of similar prophetic text. Um, so Isaiah 53.1 is really just continuing the thought uh, that it was in 53.2 as it was in 53.1 and so on. So it's really hard to argue this one. But we could start at 53.1 uh, wherein Yeshua says, Who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of Yahweh revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten, of God and afflicted. That's interesting because if we're looking at messianic passages here and in the chapter before we can see that it it does use the language in English um, behold my servant uh, and and it's it's continuing on with the the same thought here. Now, I find it interesting that he said, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Smitten of God. Stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. That's very interesting uh, how that's translated in the English. Now, the born our griefs part, of course, and carried our sorrows. But um, before that, when Isaiah 53, 3 says he's despised, and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Well, he was certainly despised by the, um, you know, if we're talking about uh, Yusho here, he was definitely despised by Pharisees, scribes, uh, those who would be considered the uh, spiritual leaders in Judea. Now, Isaiah 53, 5, but by the people, he was thronged by the people. There were places he was going, he, he could hardly move. The people were, of course, most of them came to get healed or fed. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And Yahweh hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And now that passage right there cannot be talking of anyone else because there was no one else whom Yahweh decided was the one to lay the sins, the iniquities of Israel upon. You see, if you don't have Yahushua as the accepted Mashiach, 
of Yahweh, upon which for our sins to have been laid, so that he could redeem us and clean us and justify us from our sins, you don't have another. For those who don't believe him to be Yahweh's Mashiach, of course they have to look for another and have been for quite a very long time, following after all manner of deviance in the process. So I would have to say, and, and of course, we've seen this actually, all of these verses that I'm going over here in 53, and you're going to see them in 52, they're highly dense in this portion of Yeshua. And you're going to see them repeated in the New Testament. Many of these verses I would be reading if I read these surrounding chapters, you're going to see them all over the New Testament. So I would have to say Yeshua is quite an important book to get to know if we want to know and understand more about our Mashiach or Messiah. So I don't think, and I'll tell you what, Brenton's is saying just about the same thing. I can start in Isaiah 53.3 in Brenton's. His form was ignoble and inferior to that of the children of men. He was a man of suffering and acquainted with the bearing of sickness, for his face is turned from us. He was dishonored and not esteemed. He bears our sins and is pained for us, yet we accounted him to be trouble and in suffering and in affliction. And I won't go on because, again, we can see these repeated in other places in the New Testament, or not repeated but quoted. Uh, this whole area is heavily uh, messianic, heavily messianic. There is a lot of the so-called Old Testament that's heavily messianic. Um, it's just a matter of understanding why certain things would be chosen. I'd like to know that. If, if I look at certain passages, and I can't for the life of me understand why that was chosen and applied, that confuses me. It worries me. I wonder what, what is it I don't get? Why am I not understanding? Because I don't think a lot of these other people who purport to be so spiritual and, and oh, I get it. There are people who will say, there are very, very popular and influential teachers who will, they will give interpretations of biblical doctrines, and these might be very poor interpretations, or they may be interpretations that make certain people, let's say whether they're not charismatic in any way, shape, or form, whether they're a little bit, just whatever, I'm using charismatic in that whole thing there as just a basis to comment on this. I mean, you know, they will say that if if people don't understand the way a certain passage is actually defining how every Christian should be charismatically, if they don't understand that, then they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. And they won't say it like that. You know, they'll say that you have to be spirit-filled to understand that. Uh, and I think that's a cheap cop-out in a lot of ways. You need to be able to prove these things, not just say, if you're not filled with the spirit, you're not going to understand it, or you're not going to see it in a certain way. Cop-out, cop-out, cop-out. That's why I want to be able to look at these New Testament quotes of the Old Testament. I want to go back to the Old Testament. And I want to understand why those quotes were inserted in those books by whomever they ins inserted them, because we've only got names at the top of a lot of these books. The, to my knowledge, there are little to no outside records 
affirming certain people as the authors of certain books. You know, you have the book with a name Mark on it. Now, in all of uh, the New Testament, you're only going to find one Mark, and that's John Mark, um, which traveled a little while with Paul and was known by Peter. And many people, when they consider the tone of Peter's epistles or Peter himself, they would say that Peter actually dictated the book and Mark wrote it. But that's tradition. There aren't absolute provable answers to a lot of specifics. Not right now, there aren't. And again, even, even if I can't, uh, pertaining to each verse, uh, cannot show conclusively one way or another uh, how it does point specifically to the Messiah or not, at least we can air it out a little bit and give everybody, including myself, something to mull over because this has been uh, an enormously vexing problem for me for a long, long time, is referencing these New Testament quotes and not understanding why they're used where they're used, or having read these New Testament quotes so many times, or heard them quoted so many times by preachers, teachers, and so on, uh, I find myself actually reading that Old Testament book, and I come across that quote in my course of reading, and something registers in my mind, hey, I've seen that quote, I know that quote, and then I, I look it up after I've read it in context in its Old Testament book, I look it up, I see that, and I have to think to myself, I, why, why was that quote chosen by that author? I don't understand. We have found that thus far some of the biggest head scratchers were quoted from Matthew. This on the other hand I'm going to say is not a head scratcher. I think that the quote and in its context is clearly messianic. Uh, Although, I would certainly like to explore more about it, and as I said, it's part of a, a context that is way, way, way larger. Do not have the time to do so. I think it's worth doing, but am I confused or scratching my head after seeing that being quoted in its context in Matthew? No. And... As we're going to go, we're going to see that there are there are a lot of uh, Old Testament quotes quoted in the New Testament, specifically in the book of Matthew, that may not be quoted somewhere else. And then that could lead us to the whole argument about which synoptic was written first, and who copied who, and who put what in where. We're not going to get into that. So the next one is a, a chapter forward. It's in Matthew 9.13. So this one's interesting, because we really need to look at this in the context of Matthew, and then look at it in the context that we find it in the Old Testament. Now, me personally, you see, I... I really enjoy a lot of these dialogues too, by the way, between you, show, and really anyone, and then looking at the Old Testament equivalent and figuring that out, because I think he knew the Bible better than anyone who's ever lived. And not only the biblical quotes that are attributed to him, but his teachings, specifically in the form of parables and other kinds of teachings. I I get excited about that personally because, as I said, it, it can't just be some quotes that we don't understand or don't seem to match up that turn this into a house of cards. No, no. 
Uh, for those who'd like to see it as a house of cards, the thing is there's far too much mitigating circumstances concerning not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament too. We're not looking at a paper-thin God. We're not looking at something like the Wizard of Oz, where there's just a man behind a curtain pulling levers and ropes to make things happen. We are looking at a conglomeration of books that have been written over the course of a couple thousand years that still yet manage to maintain the same voice even in the face of different styles of writing from the different authors. It's uncanny. And as we, we learn and share ideas and people dedicate um, more intellectual time into this and our sphere of knowledge continues to grow and solidify I believe what we're going to see happen is that the text is going to prove itself out to be quite truthful and historical and accurate. Are all the translations or the set of autographs, which we believe, you know, may be in uh, the original language, are those going to prove out to be so? I don't know about that. But the text, the authorship, and the characters being written of, most specifically, the living God and his Messiah, are going to be proven to be seen as more and more and more and more solid so that no one will have an excuse because I don't think we're looking at an unjust God whatsoever an unjust Messiah whatsoever great passage in its context Matthew 9 and 13 Matthew 9 and 13 a lot of preachers just say that, 9 and 13, which is okay. So, uh, yeah, we should start at 9-9 nine, nine and just read forward. That's enough to give us a good idea of the context. Oh, look, and, and can I please add this as mitigating? And uh, sure, anybody who wants to can call it my opinion. I'm good with that, whatever. The mind of common man. And this would be in the light of theories like, say, Caesar's Messiah, etc. The mind of common man cannot invent a life not only so beautiful, complex, a mind so transcendent and sharp as the mind we see in this man, Jesus of Nazareth. The common human mind cannot just contrive the mass of parables, sayings of wisdom, application of scripture, being in his day the fullness of what's called today the Old Testament. The sheer love and beauty of the life he lived, the ministry he performed, the death he died, nor the significance of the resurrection and the impact it had on those who directly knew him and everyone from that point 
forward. It is, and he is, transcendent of human devices. I would say that is a very strong mitigating factor in favor of the accounts that we see to be true <clears throat> and that there is just a number of things that we, like me, being mortal and full of fault, not perfect, not being able to understand, but I will at least admit what I do not understand and what I cannot yet see. So starting in Matthew 9.10, it says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. I'm going to equate this essentially as like in our day, if they were a number of people who worked for the government, government agents or employees, and general riffraff, probably a boisterous, crude, whatever, okay? Alcoholics, drug addicts, you name it. If it's using the word sinners, so basically people that the folks who are fine, upstanding citizens would not like very much to be around. They came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth? Why eateth? <laughs> Sorry. Why does your master eat with publicans? And sinners. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, Yeshua himself is telling these Pharisees, why don't you go learn what this means? And then he quotes. So we'll click on 9.13, and we can reference this real quick too. We're looking at Hosea 6.7. And if it's in Brenton's, it would be 6.6. 6. So we've got a verse difference. Back to Hosea. real quick, or as quick as possible. <clears throat> All right, so it's 6-6 six, six in uh, KJV, uh, and starting at 1 would be fair. Uh, keep in mind that the book of uh, Hosea, or actually his name is the same as our Redeemer's, yet uh, all you really have to do is drop off the Y at the begin, um, beginning, and it sounds quite like it when pronounced. He would be Yusho or Eusho. It's really just that Y. It's a very similar name. In fact, uh, Joshua, the successor of Moses, is, um, is called that. His name is called that at least once in the text, as well as the fuller name, Eusho. So it's basically the same name. You have the difference being the Y or so-called Yad. So anyone who basically knows the story of this prophet Hosea, he is told to go and get a, a prostitute and make her his wife and love her. And, um, and he does. And he has these children by her. And as he's having these children, he is marking things that are being done or are to be done by the names of these children. This is massively important when it comes to, say, all of those blank periods in time that the Bible records. We don't know what's going on. Well, we have genealogies, don't we? Um, oh, and this is going to be something else that's going to be featured on the Obrey Project website is 
uh, in time, we're going to be looking at genealogies as being filler history. Very exciting. So, after he tells about what happened with the prostitute and the children and what he names them, and then she leaves him again to go back to her prostitution, and this all, of course, being a picture object lesson of the house of Israel. Of course, um, Yahweh, I mean, in the very first chapter, he says that he is, um, they're, they're going, they're gone, out of the land, they can't have the land. Uh, and he's been very patient with them for a long time, and he says that he's going to scatter them. Um, he says they're no longer going to be his people. He essentially divorces them at that time. However, he does promise them through many various prophets a redemption at some point forward. And specifically in Hosea 1.11, he says, even though they are to be called not my people, the number of them would be as the sand of the sea, and in the place, that is, in the location where they were called not my people, they'll be called the sons of the living God. That's important, in that location. So by the time we get to Hosea 6.1, it says, Come and let us return unto Yahweh, for he has torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, and in the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then we shall know if we follow on to know Yahweh. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, and the latter and former rain unto the earth. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto you? O Judah, what shall I do unto you? See, he's referring to the house of Israel, those ten tribes, as Ephraim or Aprim. For your goodness, is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goes away. Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goes forth. For I desired mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. <clears throat> so what did he want? Did he want the blood of all of those animals? Or did he want obedience? And this is this is a merciful God speaking. Jesus told the Pharisees that you need to go and learn this. Now, it's interesting because of who he's talking to, the Pharisees. The Pharisees being some of the earliest practitioners to what many people refer to as the traditions of the elders. Many people say that the traditions of the elders that they practiced, they taught, and even enforced as law, are what became the Talmud. Maybe. I mean, maybe. And here's why I say that, because I've seen it with sect after sect, church group after church group, and various religions, that no matter how pure the instructions, the word that they have, or the way that they started out, that they can so easily go astray into their traditions. And in fact, if everything I've ever read about the Pharisees and the way that they were founded is correct, they were actually started with very good intentions. And a lot of what became their laws were meant in a way for good to preserve the integrity of the people and their way of worshiping the living God. And it, of course, degraded. There are so many things that do that. At first, they are meant to preserve. And then they just end up 
persecuting. Um, in Yusha's day, those Pharisees, as he describes them, they, um, they had very nice clothing. They were very well respected. They were the... Uh, I would see them, if I tried to picture them in my mind, I would picture them very much like, say, um, popes and cardinals and bishops and rabbis and highfalutin, well-dressed preachers. Uh, they were the people that, by the very sight of them, you would think, well, this must be a very clean, upright guy, lives a very clean life. But um, he says that inside they're just full of dead men's bones, like sepulchers. So when they say that about him eating with these government workers, and we all know that if you're going to work for the government, you're not going to be a friend of the people. You're going to be enacting or carrying out usually very adverse policies uh, against your what should be your brothers and your neighbors and sinners. So prostitutes, alcoholics, drug addicts, foul mouth, rough living people, right? Because he came not to call the righteous to repentance, but the sinners. And I think that there was uh, quite a note of sarcasm to that as well. I didn't come to call the righteous when it was the Pharisees themselves that should have been repenting the most in many cases. Um, and this is exactly what we see Yahweh saying concerning mercy. I don't want the sacrifices. He says it through other prophets that the sacrifices in the holy days were making him sick. They were making him ill. The songs that were being sang to him hurt his ears. He was sick of it. It disgusted him. I don't think that should be taken as those things that he instituted in the first place, specifically in Leviticus and elsewhere, but specifically. I don't think we should take it as those things were they practiced from a pure heart, disgusted him, that he got sick of them. He got sick of them because all they were is some dead, um, going through the motions of these people. And this is precisely what the Pharisees did. They, in a very dead, very cold way, exalting themselves in their own minds and their own hearts, had turned the pure worship of him, which is obedience. Obedience through love. They, they had turned that into something very perverted. And so he's telling these people specifically that they should go and learn the meaning of that passage. And they would have known the passage he was speaking of, because I believe that at that time people had a far better understanding of the scriptures. They had committed so much to memory, I believe. So they would have known. And if they didn't know, <clears throat> then I'm sure they would have remembered so they could go and look it up. So this passage, it doesn't bother me at all contextually. Uh, remember, a lot of the passages that he used in the um, when he was in the wilderness and Diablos is speaking to him, trying to test him or tempt him, these were all contextually very well understood why he would pick certain uh in context, it was just the psalm. Um, I didn't see any any signs in that psalm that it was to Messiah, per se. But again, how much of these texts do I not fully understand? Because I'm willing to admit that that's 
possibly a, a very, very big proportion of my lack of understanding. So the next video I do in this series, and, and keep in mind, uh, oftentimes with my series, I will do a, a certain amount of work up to a point on these things and then present them in clusters as I can. Sometimes it's too difficult for me to continue and that's why I have to keep a number of different things cooking and you know go back and forth and then at a later time uh, turn them into playlists or you know something like that. So the next thing uh, we would be looking at is again Matthew 10 35 and 36 um, I'm just going to say it one more time. I find it interesting how many are heavily in Matthew. Of course, Matthew, Matthew sort of being like Mark, just with a lot more detail. Uh, Luke being a lot like Matthew, except for variations on the detail. And John only resembling the others in certain ways which would be like the structure of the, the ministry, the death and resurrection of the Messiah. So, uh, all right, we'll pick it up next time with uh, Matthew chapter 10 and 35 and 36. Some of these are going to be great because we don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time uh, scratching our heads wondering about why that context was chosen. Some of these are going to be really great because of uh, what's being said and what's being pulled from the Old Testament, which we, I think in general, you know, just like everybody, uh, including myself, we have a pitiful lack of understanding of. Just like, let's just say, let's just say all of it, New and Old Testament. I think that's fair. So uh, until next time, everybody, uh, I hope you're well.